Power of the Blood, page 50. When you find that, let's stand together. We'll sing the first, the second, and the last dances. tonight and a good crowd this evening and a couple things to let you know about the financial report for the month of april is on the back pew if you'd like to pick up a, a copy of it it's uh, available for you right there and uh, also our ladies uh, activity coming up on may 20th uh, the shopping activity and uh, we have a sheet here uh, to start signing up for that i'll put that out here on the lord's supper table this evening if you know your you're planning on attending and going on the trip, that would help us out and uh, have that information there. So after the service, when I don't put it out, somebody remind me where's the sign-up sheet, Pastor. And uh, it's underneath the pulpit. And uh, so uh, anyway, uh, these things are happening right now. Uh, also continue to be praying for uh, some of our folks uh, that are not well. They're trying to recover and get well. And uh, also, we're glad that Karen's finally back home safely. Amen. She's been uh, traveling for the last month, I think. And uh, it seems like it for her probably uh, being going about everywhere, seeing her, her family. And I'm glad she made it back safely, though. And uh, I do want to remind you, for, the, um, for those who want to help out the Wings Ministry, uh, Women in God's Service, uh, they we're trying to uh, get some clothing uh, to ship off to one of our missionaries we're working with. And uh, Brother Jim Campana in Juarez, Mexico. And what we're doing, we're trying to get modest, well made, gently used dresses for the Christian uh, sisters and for the little girls living in poverty down there. This is, in doing this, this helps in a way which I never would have thought of. Uh, but they, the women are, and the girls are dressed nicely. So uh, there's a less of a possibility they could be uh, kidnapped in uh, human trafficking. And that is very common uh, down through Mexico. And so uh, we're trying to protect these young ladies and these ladies and uh, these girls. And uh, so the clothing will help if you have something you can help out with, not cast offs, not stained clothing, not, uh, but uh, as, a, as a Bolton mentions, modest, well-made, gently used dresses. And you can bring them and put them down next to the a cabinet in the fellowship hall. There's a metal cabinet down there. There's one. All right. And you should be able to find it sitting on the right uh, the, on the floor there, having a box or a bag. And uh, our ladies will take care of that and we'll uh, see what it uh, get it shipped off to Brother Campana. He is very excited uh, to hear about this as we reached out to them because uh, many of their ladies are they're they're so poor. Uh, they want to make the next step and they're Christian life in, in modest dress, and you know they don't have the wherewithal to have things uh, like we can in America very easily. So this is a tremendous blessing to them, 
And so uh, if we can help out and do that, whatever you can do, uh, if nothing else, if you're not able to do it physically, pray for it and uh, pray for the ministry down there. Brother Campani has been down there a number of years. He has a, This is his second work, I believe, he started uh, down there, and uh, uh, he's been faithful. And uh, God has been using him, and many people are getting saved, and lives are being uh, changed. And so we thank the Lord for him. I do want to also mention uh, our other missionaries, continue to pray for them. And uh, did we reach our our goal for paper this week? $25 short. Next week we're going to have it, amen. And uh, we'll have that uh, fourth roll of paper. We're vying for the Bible Literature Missionary Foundation. And uh, we'll get that $25 in there and be able to mail that uh, check out to them. And uh, I know they're excited about what God is doing uh, in their work right now, they're talking about the number of trailer loads of paper they're getting out and how many uh, scriptures and Bibles are printing, different languages are going out, the containers are being loaded and shipped out and uh, sent overseas. And so uh, they're pretty excited about that, especially since it seems this year, uh, again, uh, it seems like every year churches are stepping up and, and helping them and uh, to uh, get the gospel out and get the Bible printed. And so uh, we want to continue to pray for them. Brother Wesley Pela in Brazil and a faithful man doing a good work down there. Brother Zachary Werner in India. And, uh, you know, it's a, sometimes we think that stories we hear about are 100 years ago. But I was reading a missionary letter uh, today, and uh, it's amazing how primitive things still are in parts of India. And um, you would think that everything was much more modernized now, but uh, in some ways there's a lot of primitive things that are still happening down there. And, but it was a, a story and a testimony of a man who, who got saved and given his life to the Lord and how God is using him. But the story is also opening up eyes to really what the situation is. And uh, we ought to be very thankful for being in America. I know it's got a lot of problems right now, amen. We need to pray for our country, and things need to, uh, we really like to see things turned around, but on the same hand, uh, God is preparing for his return too. And uh, he told us, warned us, these days would be coming, and uh, we would like to see them happen in another generation, not ours, but we want the Lord to come back in our generation, and uh, we can't have it both ways. So uh, things are, are bad in our country, and the direction is going, pray for it. And pray for the Lord's coming. He told us to pray for his return. And so uh, this all goes hand in hand together. And uh, be, be, do what you can today while you can. Serve while you can. Give out gospel tracts while you can. Uh, give in the tithe and the missions and offerings. Give while you can. You know, we, we really don't know what uh, tomorrow holds a month from now, six months from now, a year from now. No one would have ever dreamed we went through that, uh, that period in... Uh, 20, 2020 and into 2021, uh, we had no, I would never have dreamed our country would have uh, do, would have done what it did during that time. The shutdowns, uh, the craziness that ensued all around, and, and really the uh, uh, people got uh, scared, and uh, I guess that's all I can say, and we never would have dreamed our country that would have happened. We would say that would happen in a, in a foreign land somewhere else, but not in America, but it did. And uh, so anyway, uh, continue to pray for our country. Keep serving while you can. Amen. The doors are open today. God has given us an effectual opening. Amen. An opening in the, uh, to serve him. So um, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer at this time. Our ushers are going to come. We're going to take up our offering for tonight. Lord, we thank you for this evening. Thank you that we can be in church and, and Lord, enjoy this atmosphere of fellowship without fear. And Lord, I just ask you to bless this evening. I pray that you bless, Lord, in this offering. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please take your songbooks once again and turn to page 357. Work for the Night is Coming, page 357. When you find that, let's all stand. We'll sing all three stanzas. Bibles tonight to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I want to teach tonight on biblical standards and uh, we'll begin in 1 Samuel here. And let's have a word of prayer at this time. Father, thank you again for tonight. Thank you for your word. And may you bless it. May you bless this study. May you speak to each heart. Lord, may we hold true to the truth that you have given to us. Let us never waver, Father. I pray that you help us never to step back from it. But continue on trusting you, believing you, and uh, living in this faith that you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 8. And uh, Brother Saxon, could you get that door for me right there? And uh, it's not, nothing's going on, it just looks odd, and it's distracting to me back there, amen? Thank you. And uh, chapter 8, verse 1, down through verse 5. Then it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. And now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not the ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. You know, Israel had a problem. Their problem was they weren't like all other nations. They wanted to have a king like all other nations. They wanted a king who wore a crown. They wanted a king who carried a scepter. They wanted a king who sat on a throne and wore a royal robe. They wanted a king that led an army into battle and took credit for the victories. They wanted a king that would promote individuals and give them recognition. Those kings could be disposed of when the people were angry with them. They could just... Vote them out, usher them out. I think they did it a little bit more harshly back then. They killed them, amen? A uh, quick way to get rid of a, your king you don't want. You know, Israel's king, though, was God. He was untouchable, unable to be bribed. He knew everything. Was totally outside of Israel's ability to control and would not do what they wanted to do, or him to do. God was always right, and he never looked the other way when Israel disobeyed. And what's more, 
He brought consequences of a supernatural kind upon the people. He brought fiery serpents upon them. He brought mighty plagues against them. He brought famine and drought when they were being uh, judged uh, for their sins. Israel, though, wanted to be like other nations, and they petitioned Samuel, make us like everyone else. Give us a king. Then they went into the blame game, so so to speak. They began to point out that this is all his fault, that this is happening. They've come to this point because it's all Samuel's fault. They began to rationalize and blame him. We notice in verse 5 what was being said here. And he said unto him, Behold, thou art old. That's a mark against him right there. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. It's another mark against him right there. Now make us a king to judge us like all nations. You know, it's your fault we feel this way, they were telling Samuel. You're too old, your leadership is antiquated. We want a younger man to lead us. Besides, you messed up with your kids, and they are far from eligible replacements because they've gone become so wicked. The implication here is maybe if Samuel had been younger, he could be king. Or if his sons were more like him, maybe one of them could be the king. But they say, Samuel, you're a good man, but and all that. But we want a new style. We want a style like everyone else. We want a style like the rest of the world has. Now, God didn't want his people to be like other nations. Because they're a peculiar people set apart unto him. Now Samuel did, yes, we know, we read about it. He did have wicked sons. And that was, I'm sure, a particularly painful and a pointed stick having uh, to have poked in his eye on the national stage to remind him of what his sons were and what they did. But God found Samuel, hurt him pretty badly, and he took the rejection of the nation of Israel upon himself. They are rejecting you, he said. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Notice in verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. The Lord is looks at this and he says, I have saved them out of their adversities. I've delivered them out of their tribulations. But when it's all said and done, they don't want me to lead them. We notice in in chapter 10 and verse 19, that statement is made right there. And ye have this day rejected your God who himself saved you out of all your adversities, your tribulations, and you have said unto him, nay, but set a king over us. But set a king over us. We don't want your kingship. We don't want you any longer. God realized, who was really telling Samuel this whole thing, they don't want to follow me. They don't want to follow me. They want to be like everyone else. Israel wanted to look to a man for which they for uh, they want to look for uh, to a man for which they should have looked to God. You know, we have in our day a tremendous falling away taking place right now, all across America. We live in a great day of apostasy, and it was predicted to occur in the days immediately preceding the return of Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, I'll read it for you if you want to turn there, that's fine, but it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. You know, it's the prediction was given to us here in 2 Timothy that there would be a falling away. And that falling away would take place before the son of perdition would appear on the scene 
there will be an apostasy, apostasy, a falling away, a defection from the truth. And, and I have seen this, we've been seeing this now for a decade, probably longer now. We're watching just gradually people falling away from the truth, falling away. They no longer want God to lead them. They want to be like everybody else. The same tendency is given in the parable of the sower for the reason that uh, of the stony ground believers, they bear no fruit because there's no depth in them. In a time of temptation, they fell away because there's no depth in them. Now, what do they fall away to? That's a question. What do they fall away to? Just like separation, we've talked about that over the last several weeks, just like separation is from something to something, apostasy is falling away from something, and that something is truth. And then they're falling to something, falsehood. Falsehood, that's what apostasy is. When you wonder, you hear that term, and you read about it, what is apostasy? Is when people fall away from the tr truth, they reject the truth, and then they accept falsehood in their life. Apostasy is, is not the unbeliever's final rejection for which they never subscribed. They never did. It is the believer's departure from the truth they once held, and that's why it's called a falling away. When I say believer, let me say this. When I use the term believer here, I don't necessarily mean a saved person. I know a lot of saved people. And I talk to them, meet them on a weekly basis. But I'm talking about someone who knows and believes the truth inside. They know what this book tells us. They know in their heart what the truth is. In Romans chapter 1, verse 25, we're told who changed the truth of God into a lie. Lost people change the truth of God into a lie. Do you realize that? You know, they did it by taking something they believed was true and left it to believe something that was not true. For instance, they knew God's existence and that he made all creation. You remember a time in America when people recognized that there is a God, there is respect to God, though they weren't saved? And if they were saved, maybe they weren't serving him, living for him, but they knew God existed. They knew he existed. I was talking to one of our men. I said, do you remember years ago something called the blue law? Anybody remember that at all? They had no idea what that a few of us do. It may have been something more in the South, but when I say this, you might know what I'm talking about. On Sunday, no stores were open. No gas stations, grocery stores, food marts. There wasn't a single solitary place. You can go and buy something. You can go, couldn't go to a movie. You couldn't do anything. If your car broke down, hey, you got to wait till Monday. And they ran out of food, you better go to your neighbors or wait till Monday. Amen? It was a blue law in America. Why? Because as a nation, we recognized God. We recognized his existence, though uh, churches, you know, I, I talk to people and they say, boy, I remember when our churches were filled to the brim. I remember there are hundreds in our, our churches, they're filled up, and, uh, and you remember that too. Though people weren't all saved, they recognized God and they, they uh, went to him and, and uh, you know, at least worshiped him in some degree. You know, they knew God's existence and he made all creation, but they chose they chose to abandon that belief to worship the components of creation as gods. What do you mean the components? Well, man worships the, sun, worships the sun now. They worship the stars in astronomy. They worship animals. They care more about saving a seal or a killer whale or a dog than they do a human life. They worship the animals. And in fact, they've come now... In a point, we know they worship man himself. They fell away from the truth and accepted falsehood. They changed the truth of God into a lie. They departed from what they knew to be the truth, to deny it, to believe something else, and then declare that to be true. Don't we see a lot of that today? 
well, you know, there's really not a boy and a girl born on earth. They could be anything. There are not two species of humanity on earth. They call it binary. That means two. There's not two. There's many more than that. Now, they're claiming that is truth. They're claiming men can bear babies. They say that is the truth. Now, stupid, isn't it? It is. And that's when they reject the truth. They reject God. And then they start believing and saying everything else like this is the truth. The byproduct of apostasy of those unsaved people was idolatry and flaunting every form of wickedness there is. And by the way, there is. Yeah, I, I think our news media promotes it. You think they're reporting something, but they put it on there so often. Drag queens. You know, in a good old day, we'd take them out. Tar and feather them, Amen. Wouldn't let that foolishness in front of our children, our wives, our family, anybody at all. Some countries, they just eliminate them with death. The sexual perversions of homosexuality and lesbianism are most notably named. They abandon the accountability of, of God's revelation in favor of beliefs that permitted behavior and lifestyle that God forbade. That is apostasy. That is apostasy. Uh, what's the difference between apostasy and backsliding? Well, let me help you clarify that. Apostasy is different than backsliding. There, there are two key respects for that. First of all, backsliding is a departure from what is still believed as true. They still believe it as true. They just leave it. It's more more of a temporary, and uh, that person can be brought back from backsliding. They know what's right. They know they're living in sin. They, they know what is truth. They understand all. They didn't reject it. They just left it. Apostasy, on the other hand, is rejection of the truth because it is no longer believed. They said, I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe in a God. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in morality. I don't believe in humanity. I don't believe in, in a male and female only. I don't believe these things. And they reject all truth, and then they succumb to falsehood and lies. And the most amazing thing is that you look at people in their 20s, and they believe it totally. They can't prove a bit of it, but they just believe it and accept it. Once incubated, apostasy denies truth and makes demands for acceptance of a sweat or truth. They demand, or a falsehood, they demand you believe what they say. <laughs> the border crossing in the news recently. I mean, it's like an open door. But it's going to become more open here in a few short weeks. And uh, the news correspondent, the one who speaks on the behalf of the White House, had that woman, you know who I'm talking about, the lesbian woman gets up there and talks to all the news reporters. Well, she gets up there and wants to tell us that her lifestyle is normal, which is a falsehood. Then she gets up and says they've corralled or they're, they have 90% reduction in illegal immigrants coming into America. Now, they make these statements, they demand that you believe them. They demand that you do that. You know, if, if I'm caught saying, well, I'm caught, I'm on, uh, on live stream right now, amen, I'm busted right now. But, you know, uh, people who pick it outside and demand that I, and say, you're a hater of, of people. You're a hater of homosexuals and lesbians. Well, I never hated anybody, I just pointed out a fact, a truth. But they're going to demand that everybody accept that I'm a hater. And they're going to demand that something be done to me. That I be brought before the judges, the magistrates, and boy, I, be, I need to be fined, I need to be jailed, I need to be kicked out of office, right out of town on a rail. I guess, I don't know what that is either, but uh, what you may know. But it demands respect. They say, well, homosexuality is a ultimate lifestyle. It's a perversion, it's a corrupt mind and a perverted mind. But they say, we demand that you accept it. 
And if you say anything against it, there's consequences. Apostasy changes every scriptural principle that crosses what I want to do into one that allows it. They change the word of God. They redefine what the scripture says because they want something. They want to do something. Now, backsliding is more individual. It's uh, apostasy is rationalizing its defection. They rationalize it. They'll, they'll find scripture and try and twist it around. They'll find a way to reason it all out. Apostasy rationalizes its defection from truth. It seeks to sway others to their point of view, taking solace in a crowd. They want to get a crowd around them that believe like they believe. So they seek out friends and relatives and children and parents and church members and Facebook and Twitter and more. And, and they try and convince everybody that what they're saying now is the truth and they have become enlightened. And that's, somebody asked me about wokeism. What does that mean? Well, it's what I'm talking about right now. They say they're enlightened now. And the falling away crowd that's fallen into apostasy, they say, we've been enlightened to the real truth. What you gave us, what you taught us, what you preached to us, what you showed us in the scripture was not the real truth. We have discovered it now. But they're simply rejecting the truth and falling away. Apostasy is really evangelistic or at least proselytizing. It's always trying to gather people to believe like they believe. It refuses to hide. It refuses to hide itself in a corner. Ashamed of, and refuses to be ashamed of disobedience. They want to stand out there loud and proud, so to speak. Want everybody to know that they have been enlightened and they have the truth. That's apostasy. That's apostasy. It wants to walk down Main Street and will unashamedly twist scriptures meant to condemn it into a new understanding that actually promote it no matter what the words actually say in the context. In Romans chapter 1, verse 32 tells us, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Knowing the judgment of God. They know it, but they're denying it. They're committing sin in the rejection of it, and they have pleasure in doing it. The whole world, in general, not every individual or church will one day fall away. They'll fall away in the apostasy, in the preparations of the revealing of the man of sin. As I stated earlier that our country is in such a mess right now. It's in trouble. But there has to be a path and scripture fulfilled for Christ's return. And so does the falling away become part of that. We're devastated by it. We see friends, we see families, we see neighbors and former church members and our own family falling into this realm of apostasy. They're falling away. But they're so happy in their newfound understanding of the truth, and, and you'll never convince them otherwise. They're glad to come out and tell everybody how wrong we were and condemn everything that they've been taught and known and condemn our history of, of fundamentalism, Baptist uh, teaching. They're glad to do that. Apostasy envies the world. A people that envy the world. They want what the world has. They want that kind of church over there. They want to be part of that. They don't like this idea of being different and standing on the sidelines and maybe even being mocked or looked at differently. They, uh, apostasy doesn't want any of that stuff. They've got to fit in. They, they have to be there. See, Israel wanted to be like all nations. They were supposed to be God's people set apart from the world in every way unto God, and God was to be their king. But they looked at the world and said, we don't want what God is offering us. We want what we see in the world out there. We want to be accepted by them. We want what they have. We want a king 
to sit upon a throne. Apostasy wants to live carnally while being respected spiritually. I've seen churches where a man will stand up and preach very clear, sound doctrinal message while the whole church performs music and looks and acts a totally different way. It's okay. Preach all you want to. But the fallen away ones aren't even listening. They're living in their own little world. Well, they're living in a great big world out there of people falling away from the truth. You know, apostasy wants to follow the world while retaining identity as the people of God. We are the people of God too. <laughs> don't you dare say, I don't love God because I don't keep his commandments. Where does that say that in the Bible? Then you show them and they reject it. Well, that's not what I think. That's not how I believe. And then they change the narrative and talk about something else. Apostasy has one eye in the world, one foot towards the world, and a growing percentage of its heart in the world. It spends a great deal of energy rationalizing its imitation and taking apart any who shine a light on its true nature. I've had people tell me about situations that say, well, that's not scriptural, that's unbiblical, that's... And the next thing I knew, they were attacking me. They don't want to hear that. They want to be accepted by everybody. They want, everything's all right, you know. We're just old and traditional. We're like Samuel. We're old. I'm an old preacher. I need a younger man and another style, a different style that bring people in. You know, the good heart seeks the highest standard albeit imperfectly, and ask, what would please God? The apostate heart is always seeking to lower a lower standard and ask, how much worldliness can I justify? How much can I justify? Oh, no, that scripture, that verse, that was just for the Old Testament. That was just for the Jews. And let me tell you the historical reason behind that. And so they begin to justify their worldliness. And when other scriptures point out that it's still improper according to these scriptures, well, they change that too. No, no, that's not what that word really means. I, I found the root and it goes all the way back to the Latin. And in Latin it meant this and it meant that and this uh, language in this country and meant that. And they begin to change it and twist it around. Apostasy lands us closer to the world. It has a growing disregard for what God's word actually says and a growing regard for what I want to do. This whole, the last, this is my fifth week on, on talking about separation, talking about holiness, talking about uh, uh, coming out from among them. And, and all this is very sound scripturally, but there are many people, and there always has been a large group, that reject that because they still want to be accepted by the world. They don't want to look unique. They don't want to look different. Now, the word unique or peculiar found in the book of, I believe, Hebrews, a peculiar people. Possess. What the word means is possessed, not demonic possessed, amen? It means that we are a possession that belongs to God. We are possessed by Him. He owns us. We are His family. We are a peculiar people. And some people have taken that a different way and dressed really goofy. Being modest, you, you can dress modest but not look like a cornball, you know? And uh, you can look kind of uh, uh, fashionable and, and classic and be modest, but, uh, you know, some people think it's just I have to look weird and, and I'm peculiar, I'm strange, I'm a nut. No, that's not what the scripture says all, at all. So stop being a nut, stop being weird, and uh, be normal, amen, a, a human functioning being. Uh, but that's not what it's talking about here. You know, the world is, the, the church seems to be always reaching out to the world, always trying to find something we can uh, be part of and do. And, you know, but the very simple question is, would it please God? 
Would it please God if I go here? Would it please God if I sit among these people? Would it be God, uh, please God if I were to behave this way or dress this way? Would it please God? And, and that is a sincere believer. That is a Christian. And we find our answers in the Word of God. God gives us those answers to us. <laughs> Think about this. Think about our missionaries coming home. Not only to America with its moral compass in the Bermuda Triangle right now, but to home churches. Four short years, their church has lost its Bible. They've lost its music. They've lost its standards. They've lost its Bible preaching. But this new church they come to discover has a coffee bar, a praise and worship rock band, and a leotard youth dance team. And so this church now has woke, amen? It it woke up to the enlightenment. And little girls can walk around with a little leotard and like paint on them instead of clothing on them and and say, well, they're just little girls. They're teaching them a behavior in life to be immodest. uh, Let's not go there right now, but I will come back to that. They come back and either the old pastor, they find an old pastor with a belief transplant or a new pastor leading the church to be more like the world. Think about these poor missionaries, they come home. What do they see after four or five years on the field? They come back and they don't recognize the nation anymore. They definitely don't recognize their churches anymore. What has happened? What is going on? You know, here is a young man, maybe a young pastor. You check his background out, and he went to a, uh, oftentimes you'll find out he spent four years in one of our Bible colleges, incognito. His beliefs have shifted, or maybe he finally owned up to them in public, what he really is. He thinks family time at movies on Sunday night is more productive than God's flock, for God's flock than Bible preaching in a church on a Sunday night. Let me ask you something. How many churches are you aware of that still have Sunday night services? Look, like Daryl, you were talking to someone, they couldn't find a church that had Sunday school any longer, let alone Sunday night services. This new pastor now in this church, he considers anything that draws a crowd to be an amazing moving of the Holy Spirit. And a divine endorsement of his radical departure and not, that now qualifies his church to be completely unique, original, like thousands of other churches that departed from the faith for a feel-good religion years ago. In fact, it just becomes a spitting image. It won't be long before night services are canceled Bus ministry is shelved. Baptist comes off the church sign. The pastor's wife is named as co-pastor. It's not happening. And uh, a youth department gets a leader with a fantastic personality. And he's just great in the crowds of teenagers and fits right in the world and gets them naked on a beach activity somewhere, a teen activity somewhere on a beach. The preaching of God's word will be replaced by multimedia extravaganza, And church promotions will revolve around making church feel comfortable to lost people. Preaching about biblical living and repentance from sin will be swapped out for short entertaining talks, amazing rock concerts, Christian comedians and celebrities, and the kind of Bible teaching that manages to avoid four-fifths of the Bible. We must not apostatize. Israel did get its way. It got a king. And it did become like other nations. It had rejected the Lord to do it. In Hosea chapter 13 and verse 11, it says, I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. God, though, reject, he took what was said to Samuel and and comforted Samuel and said, they've not rejected you, they've rejected me. Go ahead and give him a king. But 
We find out later in Hosea, God is angry about it. God is angry about it. He is upset about it. And they still went to God's house. They offered sacrifices to him. They took part in worship. But God said they rejected him and they rejected his leadership. It's better, listen to me. <laughs> it's better to pastor 25 people scripturally than 10,000 people in apostasy. You can see a church where they have hundreds, they have thousands over there. What do they have though? What do they have? Do they have a, God, a, a people that, that worship the God of the Bible? The Savior of the world? Or are they just wanting to be like the world? And have a, a cheap imitation of the world sitting on a, on a church platform and really rocking it out for Jesus. It's better to hold the line on truth when children break fellowship than to abandon the truth so they can feel affirmed by us in, in their wickedness. Hold the truth. Hold the truth. You can't pat them on top of the head and say it's all okay. It's not. They're heading in the wrong direction. But we should not head there with them. You know, this whole idea of separation is very seldom preached or taught out of most churches. That's why apostasy has gripped so many of our churches. They won't talk about that we're supposed to be separated from the world and separated unto God. They make believe you can have both. But God's not accepting that kind of worship. He's not accepting that kind of commitment. He wants all of us. He wants everything about us. He wants our hearts, our minds. He wants our, our strength. He wants everything we own, everything. He wants us. And this whole idea of what we're seeing happening around us all over, and you know, I, I see things, and I cringe when I see changes. And, and sometimes I, I wait a while and look and say, that's not a bad change. That's okay. But when I see change, I, I want to know that it hasn't changed away from the truth. And so I try not to jump on the on board of judgment right today, right away, but I, I try and monitor something where I can see and understand and know where it went, where it's headed. And it's unfortunate that churches today will do about anything to get a crowd. And they will say we have a big attendance, so they say we're a successful church. And listen to me. People, pastors have gotten into the idea of worshiping success. At whatever cost, I want to appear successful and feel successful, so whatever I have to do to garner a crowd, I must have success that I might flout it and flaunt it among other preachers and other people and say, what a church we have, look at us. But then, on the other hand, people have fallen into worship of what feels good. What well, feels good to me? Well, I don't like that kind of preaching. It's boring. No, it's a lack of intellect to be able to sustain attention very long. Because the world has programmed us with TV and video and everything because everything changes on your screen every three seconds. Three to five seconds. Something's always moving. Something's always changing. You have to have that change. But the mind is incapable of studying of sitting down in a classroom and studying and reading a book and learning their lesson. They struggle with that, and they, so they hate education because they cannot do it. They say it's too hard for them. The education part is too hard. The concentration part is too hard because it's dwelt in our minds and our abilities to concentrate, and it hurts us to sit in church for an hour or 45 minutes or a half hour and listen to a sermon or a Bible study and be able to concentrate that whole time without drifting off or looking at our phones. You know, it's the, the idea, we're, not, we're supposed to be worshiping God, not success. We're supposed to be worshiping God, not how I feel about things, if it makes me feel good or not. I think a good message, usually when I go hear one, is one that caused me to go to an altar. I say, well, that was good. That was good preaching. I need to hear that. Now, I like preaching. I don't mind saying, let them have it. Get those people behind me. 
There's always people behind you because I sit down front, so all the backsliders are behind me. Get them. Get them. Let them have it. I'm all for it, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I like it when God speaks to me, though. I like it when I'm humble. I like it when I'm reprimanded and corrected, convicted. I like that. That's good preaching. And that's what we, we need to have in our life. Not this, well, I'm going somewhere that makes me feel better. I always feel bad about myself when I go to church. Well, just get right then. <laughs> That's all it is, you know. Uh, quit, quit living in the same sin over and over again. Come back every week, hear the same sermon, man. And, uh, oh, I feel terrible about myself. Well, if, if you get things right in your life, you can sit there and listen to the preacher and say, get them, preacher. Get them back there. Get them. You know, the more right you are with God, the closer you come to the front of the auditorium, you know that. And uh, amen, right there. And I got, uh, you're not all the way there yet, though, but we still got one more row. And, uh, but we want to get closer to things. We, we want to see things, how, how God has them. We're told in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, what do we prioritize when it comes to church day? Are there priorities that keep us out of church? Priorities that keep us from the Bible, our study? Priorities that keep us from prayer, from sharing the gospel, soul winning? What are those things? We're supposed to love the Father more than we love the world. Love not the world. Neither the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in Him. And what, what that's saying is we don't love Him as we should when we let other things come into our life and replace him. I always did my very best to be in church at all times. My wife was sick, the children were sick, I still went to church. Of course, I was preaching then, amen, it's pastoring. But even when our babies were little and before we went full-time in the ministry, yeah, you know, either she was at church or I was at church. One of us stayed home and watched children. If I got home breakneck speed, I'd get ready the best I could. I'd get in church. I'd hustle over there, get to my church. Why? Because I wanted to show God I loved him. I didn't want my rest to prioritize my commitment. So I worked at it throughout my life. And I continue to do so because I want him to know I love him and I make every effort. And my actions just show him that more than just words or more than just singing the song. Oh, how I love Jesus. And that's nice. It's a good song. I like singing it. But I want him to see more than what he hears. I want him to see a life of commitment and devotion to him in my life. In 2 Kings 17, 15, uh, it tells us uh, they rejected and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers. And his testimonies, which he testified against them. They followed vanity and became vain, and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. God had told Israel not to become like them. Do not do as they do, do not live as they live. There is a reason why, when Israel went into different times of war, especially in the land of Canaan, and God told him to slay everybody in the, in the city. He did not want his people drawn into their worldly culture, into their false religion, their false faith, into their heathen ways. And so if they were removed, it was prevented. But there's other reasons behind all that too. He killed the cattle and, and uh, things of that nature. But God was trying to keep his people away from the world and and time and time again, you read through the Old Testament, they kept drifting back into the world, kept going to the world. God had to judge them and chastise them. You know, we see that in our churches in America right now. So many people have a form of religion denying the power thereof. They deny God. They deny the power of His Word, His, word, his book. And so they have a form of religion. And, and you try and talk to them about it, and boy, it ensues and becomes an argument, a defense and justification of why they're right, and that Bible is not right. There are other versions of the Bible that are acceptable. Why only one? You know, they go into all that area right there. We're told also in Proverbs 24, 1, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. 
The less we know about them, the less we'll desire to be like them. The less we window shop, less likely we have a desire to purchase something. I don't know if people do that much anymore. They probably do more online window shopping now, online shopping. Oh, I'd like to get that. Oh, how much does that cost? Oh, I didn't know they had that. There's another new thing come out for your phone. Yeah, it's like, what more do they have to have? I mean, you can go in your house, tell your house, turn the lights on. It's like, I still have power in my arm to move that arm, you know? What are we going to become? Like a vegetative state? We walk around, no muscles, uh, tone anymore because we don't lift our arm, turn the light on, or open a doorknob. And, uh, you know, tell, we tell it to do everything now. And we think, of what the, what, how wonderful that is. I don't think those things are so wonderful. I think it's a downfall to a society myself, not progressing forward, going backwards. But we ought to keep our, our love to God and our commitment to him. This whole thing of separation I'm preaching on, studying on, talking about is extremely important throughout the whole scripture. As you read it and you look for it, you'll find it everywhere. You'll find it in the Old Testament, New Testament, and God talking about us being a very peculiar people, a, a very possessed people by him. And uh, we ought to be very honored that we're considered his children. When we come out from among them, be ye separate, and I will call you sons and daughters. I'll be a father unto you. When he told us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we ought to say, it's wonderful. Not everybody can have that kind of relationship, but we can have that with God. What do I have to sacrifice? What do I have to give up? That whole mess that he saved us from. Remember when you lived in the world before? Life was going so splendid, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. That's why you came to Jesus. You want something more. You want something better. You want something different. And so you come out from that mess, and why do we, during the week, run back to it then? The beginning of this area in biblical standards, amen. We're going to get into this hot and heavy and uh, look into what God is telling us. But it does give us an opening door to it, understanding what apostasy is and what what's happening around us, and the dangers of it, we need to be aware of in our own life, uh, rejecting the Word of God. You know, not everything you see from the Scriptures you're going to embrace and like because it's going to talk to you about something you need to change in your life. And some things you don't want to change because you like the way it is in certain ways, but God's still going to talk to you about it and still convict you about it. And uh, we need to receive all that He gives us. And you're going to find out as you grow in grace is the right thing to do. And why you didn't do it sooner, you'll never understand why. Uh, why you didn't accept that truth earlier in your life. And you're going to find a peace and joy about that and a comfort in your relationship with the Lord. Let's stop, and we'll take some time for uh, prayer tonight. Take about our 10 minutes together. Very quickly, again, last week I asked, give me a, who has a prayer request? Give me a prayer request. Somebody have something? All right, all right. Darla? Sharon? Yes. Smitley. Okay. Anybody else? One more. All right. Let's take about 10 minutes and uh, let's pray.